Hey, it's Jason Cunningham and welcome back to Save My Business, the podcast that helps small to medium-sized business owners navigate through the proverbial shitstorm. Now, today's guest is an absolute crackerjack of a bloke, let me tell you this. Now, early doors when I was in business, uh, one of the things that I learned very early on was the importance of focusing on who do you serve and how do you serve them. And it's the, I guess it's the overarching principle that helps you build a mission statement or a purpose. And it's my belief that if you can really focus on who do you serve and how do you serve them, if you can get that piece right, rather than focusing on what's in it for you, but what's in it for the customer and the person that you serve, then what you want will come to you. Now this, today's guest, not only is he one of Melbourne's, or should I say Australia's greatest restaurateurs and cooks, but he's a man that has, in the last six to nine months, has really focused on helping out the hospitality industry, not just the restaurants, but the hospitality industry in general, and has done a lot more than most in giving it a kickstart through his empire known as Providor. And I would like to welcome Shane Delia from Maha. Shane, welcome on board, pal. Thanks, mate. Nice to be here. Nice to see you, young man. Uh, it was good to see you doing some push-ups before we uh, <laughs> quite buff. I tell you, there's no need to flex in this room. <laughs> hey, Shane, having a bit of fun with you, and I... I've got to know you uh, over the journey, and uh, I know that you're a local uh, Mooney Ponds boy, um, which is sort of an area where I grew up, but, um, and you're living there with your family. But I guess I first got to know, and some would, some would say taste, uh, your delicacies is at your beautiful restaurant in Maha in uh, Bond Street, Bond yeah, Lane? Bond Street, yeah. Bond Street in, um, in the city, and I guess I've got a, a, a bit of a bias towards the uh, Arabic Lebanese food because my partner and not my life partner, my business partner, Robbie Haddad, uh, is Arabic, and um, I've been eating Arabic food ever since I was six or seven years old. And, and uh, Rob took me there one time, and I, uh, you know, I keep going back. But, mate, I, I'm really interested in it. You know, we've put this out on social media telling um, our listeners that you're coming on, and a lot of people are pretty excited. But I just want to take you back before we get into Providor, before we get into Maha. I want to find out more about Shane D'Elia, the person and the young boy growing up, Tell me about you growing up. Where did you grow up and what made you or gave you the inspiration to become one of this country's greatest chefs? <laughs> I never set out to be one of the country's greatest chefs. I mean, I, I grew up in the western suburbs of Melbourne. I mean, we were brought up in, um, in Auburnvale and then moved, you know, in St Albans. And then when that got a bit too much, we moved out to Sydney. My parents were one of the first people to buy one of the houses in the new estates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I come from a working class family. My dad came to Australia when he was 17 from Malta, mm -hmm. came by himself. Uh, to set up, I suppose, you know, a foundation for his family. And after being here for a few years, um, and it would have been tough, you know, 17-year-old bloke, it's his birthday today, actually. 17-year-old um, bloke coming here by himself, really dark, like my dad, my dad's like dark, dark. Mm. Um, comes to Australia, thick accent. Um, Australia in 1969 was different to what it is now. Yeah, some would um, say. And um, a lot freer back then. <laughs> in certain, in, in certain, in certain um, examples, but in some ways not. But um, dad came here, did what he did, worked really hard for about a four-year period, mm -hmm. and then his family came over. And he's, you know, he's got eight sisters, mum and dad, and they, and he's the eldest son. So you know, he's really he was sent here to set up, set up home base. So we have no comprehension of that. I mean, I'm sorry to jump on here, right? I've got three kids uh, in Australia. A couple over. No, no, I've got three boys, right? And uh, my oldest two boys are twins. They're 18 years old. You tell me a story about your father at the age of 17. You're doing that, yeah. Comes to Australia, comes to another country where they speak a different language and says, and they say to him, all right, boy, what's your father's name? Ted. Ted. All right, Teddy. Good Aussie name, huh? Yeah. <laughs> all right, Ted, go up and set up camp in Australia and bring your whole family yeah. over. I mean, that's just an amazing... And you think about what, I mean, when you really break it down, you have to find a house, you have to find sheets, you have to find beds, you have to find pots, pans, plates, cutlery, crockery, the whole lot, yeah? I mean, you have yeah. to set up house, you know, and a big enough place for everyone. Find everyone schools, find everyone jobs, you know, mum and dad jobs, all that kind of stuff. Big, big job. So he did that and then, you know, met my mum and he worked He worked at the Dunlop Tyre Factory at the front of the, at the uh, Western Oval in, the, where yeah. the, in Footscray. That's why we're a big Bulldogs family. Yeah. And then worked for Dunlop pretty much his whole time in Australia. Mm. Um, you know, worked there for 30 plus years. And um, yeah, we grew up in the West, and it was—it was—it's—it's it's, it's framed who we are. We had real experiences, real people, mm. working class background, and it's really giving me the strong base that I've needed. Mm. That's helped me, I suppose, for my resilience now. 
yeah. because I think growing up in some of those confronting environments, having you know real situations, real life situations, a lot of people that I just thought was real life, but when you start to speak to people from other environments, other demographics, well, it wasn't real. It wasn't normal. Mm. You, know? you didn't have to duck and weave on the way to school. Well, <laughs> there was a bit of ducking and weaving, but also, you know, just exposed to different people, different circumstances, different versions of what reality is. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really sort of set me up because now I can move between rich and poor, old mm. and young mm. and get things done. Because at the end of the day, people are people, right? Yeah, people are people. And it doesn't matter where they're from. They've all, it's all about experience and life mm. experience and mm. what they've experienced and how you can relate to it. So and I think that's always been my strength. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've been, what skill, like the skin color you have, or mm. what your preference is. Mm. You can find a way to relate, yeah, and try not to judge. And I think if you're in that position, you're not judging. You can relate, and it's all even. You get there. So you leave school at how old were you, Shane? I was just. I was like I was 16. I was kind of on the verge, yeah, 16. Yeah. And you what? Become an apprentice chef? Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I was never. I mean, I was. I, I had. Oh, well, I still have um, ADHD. Okay. So school wasn't great for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, not I wasn't stupid and I don't think I'm stupid now, mm. but I found it really hard to focus, really mm. hard to connect. And, and I mean, it wasn't like it is now where you can go and get diagnosed and get treatment. Mm. I mean, ADHD wasn't a thing. Yeah. Nah, so, yeah. so you're constantly getting suspended, you're getting in fights, you're, getting, you're being disruptive, your yeah. teachers are telling you that you're, you know, Satan. And mm. lucky I had it. I've got, an, I've got a saint of a mum who believed in me and believed that this wasn't just me acting up, that there was something bigger. And she stuck with me through that whole journey. And it wasn't until my last year of high school that they were doing a trial um, at the Sunshine Hospital with a doctor named, child psychologist named Dr. Martin Wright. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were doing this test case of ADHD. Not, mm. They put through 150 kids, 50 of them were diagnosed with ADHD and the others weren't. And I was one of the 50. And they, they gave you um, dexamphetamine and Ritalin. Uh-huh. And I went from D to a B within three weeks. Oh wow! Yeah, just cr- just yeah, that's just awesome. Light switch come on, yeah. and you'd rush home from school, study straight Excited. away. Excited, yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. you, you knew you could achieve. Yeah, you know, because because I, uh, I knew that there was it wasn't that I didn't want it. You wanted it, you just couldn't do it. Mm. So suddenly, when you can do it, you'd come home, shut the door, yeah. get the homework done. The next day, bang! <laughs> yeah, fucking take look that. at this. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was good, and then suddenly you're not the you're not the you're not the you know the the black sheep. Yeah. But even through that journey, I'd already decided I wanted to be a chef. Why is that? What what drew you to being a chef? Uh, I think I mean I think that I, I needed structure, and from what I knew about hospitality, it had structure. I mean, at that, that time, sort of year ten, year eleven, yeah. you're going through this whole workplace thing. What are you going to be? What are you going to study? Um, and I went to a, a school that was quite TAFE driven. You know, they had an automotives department, they had a home economics department, they had a textiles department, and I did all of them. Even though my mates never went and did textiles and home economics, I was the only bloke there. Yeah. But I did it because I, I knew that I wanted to do something with my hands. Mm. Um, and from more I learned about hospitality, I knew that it had a structure and a hierarchy. And I kind of needed that. I needed to know what you had to do to get to the top, where you had to be. And I think also I spent a lot of time in a big Mediterranean family. Yeah. And it's about, you know, family and cooking and growing stuff and mm. eating and mm. sharing. And a lot of those memories are with my grandparents. And I had a really, I loved all my grandparents, but especially my dad's father. Yeah. I had a really good, you know, connection with him. So the more time I'd spend with him around food, it just drew me to it. And I, you know, that's why I'm in it now. And it's and it's more than just the food, it's the experience I'm hearing from you, Shane. It's that it's the people that you spend it with and it's the time that you have. You you went into uh, your first restaurant, Maha. Um, that you started that when, when did you start that business um i started that when i was 28 yeah um before then obviously i did a formal apprenticeship mm. and i worked in all like you know did most of my time at the sofitel the restaurant uh-huh. um where a lot of great chefs came out of and then i moved around a bit and did my thing and i ran shadow yearing out in the arrow valley for a while as well and mm. but then it was time to start again and i, I was actually going to give up cooking like at the end of my time in the valley i was sort of 27 26 mm. started cooking since i was young so i'd already been doing it for about 10 years and i'd I kind of thought I'd achieved everything that I wanted to achieve mm. and I was just about to get married, I was, I was engaged. And I thought, I don't know if I want this mm. moving forward. It's a shit of a job, you work like a donkey, yeah. money's crap and my wife doesn't, my future wife didn't deserve that. And I thought maybe I'll start again. Mm. But we went on a holiday, we went, over, we went over to Dubai and then spent some time in Jordan and um, in Morocco and I just fell in love with food again. Mm. Like fell in love with hospitality again mm. and I went, if I'm gonna cook, so I was cooking French food then. Yeah. But if I'm going to cook, I want to cook this food. This is the food I, I love. This is this relates to my heritage. Yeah. And that's when I came back and decided that we'd do something. And that's when we opened Maha in um, 2008. 
So 2008, a bit of a challenging time. Uh, a little thing called a GFC sort of came along. Yeah. <laughs> so one would argue not the ideal time yeah. <laughs> to set up a restaurant uh, in the CBD. How did you ch- how did you combat those challenges? Uh, it was well, you had to, right? I yeah. mean, you did. It wasn't a decision. Like you didn't say, "Oh, it's GFC. Fuck, let's open a restaurant." <laughs> um, we'd already started opening a restaurant and getting the things ready, and then it came. It's sort of like now, like what do you do? Like mm. you have to be battle hard, and you have to you have to find a way. You know, like mm. you can't just give up. Mm. It's the environment you're in. Mm. So what did we do? We, 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 we looked at our business model and our strategy and what it was and what, we would, what the product we wanted to take to market. Mm-hmm. Um, we were lucky that the product we wanted to take to market was probably the right product for that environment. We weren't aiming for the stars. Mm. Like Maha where it is now is like leagues ahead of where we started. Mm. You know, we said we're going to go for really humble, Middle Eastern approach, mm. about family, keep it simple, keep it pretty cheap, keep it tasty, mm. um, and just try to create a point of difference and connect with our business network. And that was a big thing because that strategically we chose that site because mm. we thought, okay, this isn't in the Paris end of the city. No. This is, you know, you've got the law precinct and you've mm. got, a, you know, you've got, you, you know, you've got, you know, good accounting precinct mm. around there. Let's let's connect with these guys mm. and Maha will be a lunch venue. And we mm. thought it was just going to be a lunch mm. venue with a bit of a bar in the evening and yeah. But it didn't end up that way. It ended up being a dinner restaurant. Yeah. The bar element never really nah, kicked off. No, not really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it be, ended up becoming more of a fine dining venue. But I mean, in 2008, it was really hard. Mm. It was really, really hard. You just, I just, I, I would get in there every morning. I remember I'd get in there at 6 a.m. and I'd leave at 3 a.m. Like you'd get, you'd be dead. Mm. You'd go home, you'd sleep, you'd wake up. Your f- shoes would still be warm from the night before. Wow! Like it was, it, it, it broke. Like it almost broke me. Yeah. Like at some stage, you'd be like just shaking mm. at work because you just had nothing left. But I knew that if I didn't put it all in, then that there wasn't going to be a future. Where, where did that resilience come from, Shane? I, I, I'd, I'd give that to my dad. Yeah. I think, I think that something I've always believed is there's been so many people that have given up so much for me to have the chances I've got mm. that I can't just let it. Go. The more I get to know you, Shane, the more I hear a person that just keeps focusing on giving back to others. It's not really about you. Uh, it's about you know who you can help, whether it's your, your wife and your kids, whether it's your parents, your grandparents, uh, or the community. And you know that's one of the reasons why I, one would argue, stalked you uh, for a few weeks. <laughs> Well, I mean, okay, so the bit in the front yard, I know that wasn't appropriate. <laughs> At least you had your pants on that time. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that time, <laughs> as opposed to today. Um, yeah, no, but it, I, I was really, I'm really humbled by what you've done uh, for those around you. And uh, and I, I, yeah, I just thought it was compelling to get you onto this podcast because, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we've had in the last sort of six to seven months is the fact that we've all been faced with this adversity. Mm. And it's really challenging. And, and I say this respectfully, but some people haven't really faced adversity. So this is the first time and they're getting belted. You know, I'm talking to a bloke who's been faced with adversity yeah. quite a few times. Yeah. So you go, Jace, this is, mate, this is normal for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'll just, I've got to change. So there's, there's, no, there's no excuse to fail. I've got to just make something happen, yeah. right? You know, your old man comes out here as a 17-year-old kid brings his 18 sisters and, you know, half his family across and does all that sort of stuff. You know, you go to a school where you didn't realise you had ADHD. And you also don't realise the environment that you, you, you're you living in. Yeah. You know, like, you, I think that, like, I mean, I, I grew up in a great environment and I don't, I don't, I would never change it. If you could go ask me, would you want to swap and be brought up in, you know, south of the era? No chance. Mm. I, I love where we grew up mm. and I love the experiences that we had. And I mean, let's face it, the Mooney Ponds Creek is so much better than the <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wasn't in Mooney Ponds then. Back then, Mooney Ponds was like Turak for me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> well, I, I was in Deer Park. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is the Turak of the North. I mean, it's still in the freaking North, but it's the Turak of the North. So what, what compelled you? you with Maha, you uh, had some business partners and, and now, you, you know, then you ran it on your own and you managed to pick up and buy the, uh, the freehold of where you're at. And then there's Maha's popping up everywhere. There's Maha Bar, Maha East, uh, there's Middle Ground. You've got quite a few restaurants. And along the journey, uh, I see your smiling uh, head on television, Ready Steady Cook and, and postcards on, on Channel 9 on a Sunday, which I think is great viewing, young man. Yeah. <laughs> how, how did you find that transition of moving into television? Uh, television for me was an opportunity to connect to people. Mm-hmm. I've also got a show called Spice Journey, which airs in, you know, um, 300, what is it? Hundred and something countries. Spice Journey. Yeah, so Spice Journey airs on SBS. Um, we did three series of that. Three series of that. We did series one was Lebanon, 
Iran and Malta. And then we did a series, a whole series in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And then we did one, um, the Moorish Spice Journey, which was in Morocco and Andalusia in the south of Spain. Yeah. So that was that was really the, the show that really gave me an opportunity to connect. I mean, it's globally, we've got a good presence, mm. presence with that show. Mm -hmm. But TV, the first time I got a chance to do TV was at Channel 10. Yeah. Uh, back then it was the Dave and Kim show with Dave Raymond, Dave Raymond, Kim, Wat, Kim Wat, uh, Watkins. And mm. that, was, that was really cool. It was just when we opened Maha. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, we're in GFC, we've got Maha. I need people to know about this thing. I'm just some wog from the Western suburbs. How do I get my name out there? I was lucky enough to have a connection at Channel 10. There was a, they used to do a breakfast, like a cooking show in the yeah. morning. And I had an opportunity to go on there. And, and I've always had the view that I don't need people to do things for me. Just give me the chance. Yeah. Just one chance. If I fuck it up, mm. that's on me. Yeah. Like I'll own it. Yeah. But just open the door a bit. I'll mm. kick it through and bust it open and mm. do everything I have to do. Mm. So, I mean, that's how you got your first TV. But yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was a knife involved, that one. <laughs> no, uh, I bought my first TV. I remember I saved for it for a long time. Um, I, I remember my first TV I bought because I saved all the money that I got on my communion and then on my confirmation. Oh. I put that money together and I bought my TV. Yeah, fantastic. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, t the, the, uh, the TV, I thought I got a great shot. And I, I've always tried when I do something like that and I come into a new environment. It's not always about sucking up to the boss. No. It's about looking after the, the every, every, average guy, the every man. You know, so I, the, go, the girls in makeup, you get to know them. The, yeah, the cameraman, yeah. you get to know yeah. them. The sounder, you get to know them. The person them. that feeds you. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, you, know, yeah. you get to know all yeah. these guys because really everybody wants to know the boss. And you meet them anyway. I established a good relationship mm. with everyone. I cook something, give it to everyone to mm. taste and all that kind of stuff. And then that led to the next thing and then the next thing and then you get a shot on Ready Steady Cook, which was a, a big one. Yeah. And then the, you know, obviously the relationships I'd built at, not at 10 at that time were really good because the producer that we had, uh, Mindy Stacy, said to me, these are the things you need to know when you go for your audition. So you're getting those mm. relationships that you'd built started mm. to pay off and help mm. you. Still a great friend today. Then Ready Steady Cook was awesome. And then that opens you up to real sort of commercial television. Yeah. Um, you know, you're a big studio, pre-records, three episodes a day, live studio audience, and it really tests you. Um, plus the cooking, you know, like you, you're really cooking. And yeah. that wasn't staged. I thought it was staged. Yeah. You, they get there and they say, you have to come up with three dishes in three minutes and these are the... They, you didn't know shit. They give you the box and you have to actually think of those dishes. Oh, so you're really cooking? Yeah, like you had no yeah. idea. Yeah, and right. you're trying to host the show and keep oh it... Oh, my God. Yeah, it was yeah. full on. Yeah. So um, then after that... Um, I think SBS put out their little statement saying they wanted to do a, a, a Middle Eastern travel show. Mm. And I had like every production company in the state coming and asking me, did you want to do it? And I found one company, but they all came and said, we're doing a show. Mm. This is what it's going to be about. Do you want to do it? And then one company came, Central Media, based out of Sydney, yep. came and said, if you were to do a travel show in the Middle East, what would it be about? And straight away, they had me. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it wasn't even about the money or whatever, the approach yeah. and the attitude. I went, wow, this is, this is a great company. Yeah. And we did three series and it airs you know, globally. And then that's given me the opportunity to do all the other things, you know, the Mercedes-Benz ambassadorship, the, yeah. the, the, the Western Bulldogs, Melbourne City, Host Plus ambassadorship. All those things came, uh, they, they came to fruition for, you know, because of the media presence that I've yep. built through Spice Journey. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Um, it's interesting television. It's a funny medium. I never reached the dizzy heights that you have, but I, working on The Living Room on Channel 10, I, one of the things that I found interesting was, you know, when I moved from the environment that I'm here at the practice, you know, running and owning the business to being the boss, uh, my first foray was in at SEN. It was a, a sports radio station over in Richmond, which has moved now. And when I came in onto SEN, I, I found out that, you know, at the practice, I was the number one guy, you know. At SEN, I was number 100, yeah. right? You know, Tim Watson, David Swartz, Gary Lyon, and right down the bottom, number 100, right? Yeah. And I slowly, you know, I was taking the freaking bins out, you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't have, they didn't even give me a pass. But as I, very similar approach, wanted to treat everyone with respect and treat everyone equal. I, I couldn't care if you owned the... I owned a joiner if you're the CEO or who you were, but just treating everyone with the same level of respect I think is important. And I made my way from number 100 to about number 78. So yeah. you, know, <laughs> you did all right. You did, did okay. Uh, and then you're yeah, jumping onto Channel 10 and working in Sydney on the living room. But the person that I wanted to spend the most time was Marco, who's the audience warm up guy, yeah. right? Because they, if fun. You, yeah, they, and they also give you the biggest pump up when you come on, you know? So, Fast forwarding, um, and one of the things before I do talk about Providor, which, uh, you know, again, I really want to commend you, and I'm not the first bloke that said that to you, right? <laughs> um, but it, wouldn't it be wonderful if uh, uh, the brain surgeons and the powers that be that uh, are running our state and our country might just 
seek some counsel from business owners as to how we could kickstart the economy. But that could be a whole other podcast. Yeah. But one of the things that I know about you, Shane, is that you're a man that looks and, 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 and craves structure, okay, because you, you, structure helps you navigate through. H- how do you create structure when you're running restaurants, ambassadorial uh, and television? H- how do you find the time? Mm. And I think I know the answer, but and how do you prioritise what's more important over something else? Well, the two different questions in there. Mm. I mean, so I mean, how do you how do you find the time and create the structure and mm. the systems? It's about people and teams. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got really good people around me, really good teams, and and they're two different types of teams. Like I've got a really good social network of family and friends and advisors, and I don't. And, and then there's layers to that. You know, I've got look, I've, my family and my rock. You know, I've got an amazing wife who supports me to no end and really tries to give me the freedom that I need and alleviate all the other, I suppose, everyday father, husband duties that you have to worry about. I don't, I don't have to worry about that stuff. Yeah, that's like, awesome. I never have to worry about that stuff. Yeah. I don't have to worry if kids are getting fed, if they've got clothes, school bills, issues at school, fucking nothing. Yeah. Like, I don't have to worry about home. It's lockdown. So it really frees me up. And also when I get home, I don't have to put up with any crap. Like my wife is brilliant with that stuff. Yeah. Come home, if I say to a babe, I just need some time to watch the footy, I've got some time to watch the footy. Mm. So that's great. I've got an amazing brother, I've got great fam, mum and dad, cousins, all that stuff. We're rock tight. So my inner circle is rusted on. Yeah. And I know that's always a support network for me. Like mm. if I'm finding it hard in business, if I'm finding it hard personally, and I just need to get out of that shit and have my people, I've got my people. Yeah. So that that's my first thing. Then I've got a really beautiful friendship circle who are almost like a, who if they were blood they would be my family yeah you know people like david alia who's the ceo of host plus mm-hmm. kirk peterson who is a really good mate of mine who owns a business called performance shift mm-hmm. craig tiley the ceo of the open and mm-hmm. i could make you'd rattle off a ton of names mm-hmm. these people um joe shaheen who's you know you know you know he's a, like my brother and he's my my consigliere yeah, yeah you know yeah. um so i mean these people are, are my bloodline I mean, they're they're with they're outside of my industry. Yeah, they've got a whole different set of skills that I don't have. They've experienced different things, but essentially, we're the same people. Mm. We have, we hold the same values. We respect each other. Mm-hmm. We're loyal, mm-hmm. um, and I know that they would never turn on me. Yeah. So um, so that structure and those people give me the resilience, and I suppose that the. the, the the confidence I need that I can take on more projects. So I've when got, you're copping shit in the business world, you can come back out and, yeah. and those people are, yeah. But also I know that if I haven't got the skill sets, because let's face it, I'm a, I'm a dropout from high school who's okay yeah. cook, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I haven't got the I haven't got the weapons I need to do the jobs that I do, so I need to go source that stuff. Yeah, but you're no deal, mate. You're no deal. But you, what you're yeah. saying is you know what your strengths and what your yeah. genius is, and then you tap into the resources around you, and yeah. you're humble enough to say, "Hey, I don't know how to do this. Help 100%. me out." And I ask for help all the time. Yeah, all the time. Whether it's I need you connect me to that person, mm-hmm. or what's your advice on this, or mm-hmm. oh, I fucked this up. How do I get out of it? Mm-hmm. You know, um, or even if it's just. Something sim- something simple. I- I'm not afraid to ask for help. Mm. But then within my business, I've got really, really, really good people. Yeah, really good people who have become friends, and not to the point where I've had friends in business that then become friends, and then they take advantage of that relationship. Yeah. You know, and then there's no longer they're no longer good in business. They're just a friend. Yeah. Well, no, no, you need to be good in business because I've got enough friends. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. we can cross over, but yeah. the primary core here is you need to be good at what you do. Okay, so Shane, one of the <laughs> biggest challenges for all business owners is uh, finding, attracting, and retaining key people. What is your secret to doing that? I think it's to be honest. I think it's to be really honest and fair. Yeah. Don't promise shit you can't deliver. I think that's the worst thing in the world. Don't put the carrot in front of someone. Mm. If you can't deliver or you have no intention of delivering it, do not promise it. Yeah. Because all you're doing is you're going against your values, if they are your values. I mean, I don't bullshit, I don't lie. Mm. So if, the, if, if, they're not, if you're not gonna do it, don't do it. Also find people who have common values. I think that's, that's really important. They don't have to be the same people. Mm. I, I think that you need to create an ecosystem in your business, something I learned from my friend, uh, um, Kirk Peterson. You need to create your own jungle, all right? Mm. So within your jungle, look, we've got different animals. You know? mm. We've got owls, we've got lions, we've got monkeys, and we've got koalas. All right, mm. and our owls, and we've got plenty of them. They're not the same people as me. Yeah. Our owls are the thinkers. They're yeah. deep. They think. They get stuff done. You know, and we've got monkeys. All right, and they're great because they're the fucking culture people, and they're always fun, and they're always doing stuff, and yeah. they're always great ideas, and it's all great. And then we've got our koala bears, and they're our, you know, our real PC guys. 
yeah. and our human resources people, and yeah. they're all about you know the, the team and are we doing things right and all that. And then we've got the lions, and I'm the fucking lion. Oh, I can tell. You know, <laughs> and I know I'm the lion. Yeah. But you need to know who everything is in the jungle because the lion sometimes needs the monkey. Yeah. And the monkey needs the owl. Yeah. Right. And you need to know who to go to. So we do that process with our guys, with our senior guys. We make them identify who they are. So then I know who you are. You, you, I'm not going to tell you that you're an owl. You might be a monkey. Mm. If you're a monkey, tell me you're a monkey. Yeah, so at least when I need some yeah. fun, I'm coming to you. <laughs> uh, look, I, I, I'm going to tell you, Shane, I, I promise you this. I did not think that we were going to be talking about owls, koalas, <laughs> lions in a jungle. As we, yeah, so, so does each animal, so it sounds to me that each animal respects each other. And yep. res- they know uh, their place. Yeah, they know their place, right? Yeah. And, no. and, and, yeah. and, and that gives you this, the, the structure and the ability to do things because mm. you know that, okay, I'll keep loading the plate mm. and bringing all this work on yeah. and I know who to give it to yeah. because I've got, I know who everybody is. So in your team, in your business team, how, how many people have you got in the team? Well, pre-COVID, we had 120. Wow. We've, we haven't lost that many, but we, that was a mix of full-time and casual. Yeah. And our casual staff are still there, but we can't give them many hours now. Mm. I mean, now that JobKeeper... It's sort of two tiered, and mm. you can give some guys a bit of money. We'll start seeing them come back, which is great. But in the, our senior full time staff, I, I'd say there's about forty. Yeah, and they're they're rusted on. And have you got like a CEO or someone that runs that organisation? Yeah, so we did. We, we had a, a COO for for for, for Delia Group, which runs yeah. the restaurants, who's just moved on. Mm. Um, and at the moment, I'm sort of caretaking that role. Yeah, we've got a COO in Providor. So Providor sits out. Mm. It's a part of the Leah Group, but it's not a restaurant. Yeah. So I mean, there's there's in the Leah Group, there's sort of three functions: there's Providor, restaurants, and me. Yeah. You know, as a brand. Yeah. yeah. And they all act individually. So tell me then, how was Providor born? What what gave you the impetus? You know, the light bubble. How did they sort of start this Providor? It first started when they first announced. Well, before they first announced any lockdown. Yeah. Um, I, I do some consulting for the Grand Prix Corporation. Mm-hmm. I was at the Grand Prix. I was there that morning on the oh, Friday, yeah. on the Friday morning, ready to go, and I just done my rounds. My like my role is like a culinary consultant, so I went around, yeah. spoke to all the chefs, make sure everyone's good, and then we got the word that we're shutting down the track. Yeah. So I went, okay, now now this is real mm. because if we're shutting down the race, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Shit's about to get real. Yeah, yeah. So I left the track real quick because I was about to lock it down. I wanted to get out. I didn't want to be stuck there all day. Grabbed my guys and we got out. And I called an emergency meeting at our head office with everybody, all of our senior heads, accounts, everyone. So we need to be prepared for a shutdown. Look what's happening overseas. Look what's just happened today. And we did a full sort of, you know, a full due diligence of where we were financially, what what, are, what our debtors were, everything. I mm. wanted to know exactly how much liability we had on payroll, on mm. the whole works. Mm. And the accounts came back the next day and said, this is where we're at. This is what you owe. This is how long we, re- we think we can stay closed without going bust. Yeah. And I said, okay. Then I took a gut call and said, I think they're going to close us down for five weeks. And I still think if they did, straight off the bat, yeah. we would have avoided a lot of this shit. Mm. But, but they pissed and moaned and waited and poor leadership, really poor leadership mm. in the beginning. And then we had this pandemic and then they were still in it. I said, we're going to close for five weeks. So we closed. And then two weeks later, they closed us. Yeah. And I said, okay, I made the right decision. <laughs> Thank um, God. Yeah. <laughs> Number of phone calls to Dandridge, close the joint. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, they closed us down. And then there was some support and everything else. But after, and I was quite happy just to close for five weeks and close for five weeks and yeah. do nothing. Yeah. I said to my guys, we'll just do stuff. We'll, you know, we'll go mushroom picking in the fucking Talangi forest. Yeah. And all it'd, this bullshit. It'd be wonderful. Yeah, it'd be great. We'll have a great time. <laughs> but um, then, then we'll haven't they locked us down? And I went, okay, this is going to be longer than five weeks. We need to do something. Maha's got a really strong database. I mm. mean, there's a couple hundred thousand people on the Maha database. Yeah, right. Um, and they're rusted on people. Like they're really connected to the brand. And I said, I right, let's test something. A mate of mine had a fruit and veg delivery business, 30 trucks, all in storage, right? They're not delivering. Mm. I we set up a Shopify simple account, we called yeah. it Maha Go. It cost us five grand, which is the Melbourne City Council were great and gave us a, yeah. a grant, five grand grants they were giving out then. Yeah. We set it up and we tested it. And we thought, Okay, if we can do 15 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand a week, this is okay. This will get us through. Mm. This will feed our families. Mm. You know what I mean? It'll feed my family. I can take a couple hundred bucks. Mm. And that's we were just looking at it from, from survival mode. Yeah. And like you said about before about adversity, and I thought we just need to survive now. This isn't about winning. It's about surviving. Yeah. So how do we survive? We need some fucking money. Yeah. So I said it's time to hustle again. So I put the gloves back on, mm. back into the kitchen, and we're going to hustle. The first week we did about 70 grand. 
Wow. And then it grew from there. Yeah, right. Every week. Yeah. And I went, okay, this is a business. Yeah. And then I thought, yeah, he's mate, a, would have been wrapped. He's got his delivery trucks out on the road yeah, as well. Well, and he is employing all of his guys. Got it all yeah. done. And I went, okay, this is real. And then I said, this is probably something that's bigger than me. I mean, just my restaurant because I started having my other mates going, shit, we're seeing this thing all over the news. We're seeing, mm. you're hearing about it. We're seeing you on your social media. You know, thousands of boxes going out. What are you? What are you doing? And and, and I said to him, look, what are you guys doing? And they're like, we're doing hot food. I'm like, mate, it's doesn't work. Mm. You pay 30% commission to someone to take out the food. You do it yourself. You put your staff at risk. Mm. You know, like you got your waiters driving around in their Hyundai gets <laughs> with a box in the back. What yeah. happens if they have a smash? Yeah. Who's liable? Yeah. What happens if the food gets there and it's spoiled? Who's liable? Yeah. You know, so, and, and, and it was really hard because they were just trying to hold on. They were just trying to do what I was doing, but they weren't doing it properly. Mm. And I said, you're getting it wrong. It's not hot food delivered hot. It's cold food delivered cold to the bigger market. 35 Ks, 40 Ks, mm. not 5 Ks. And I showed them that this is what you could do and then they started asking how can they do it as well and I went, okay, let's let's do something that helps everybody mm -hmm. and creates a community. And then, so, you know, we, we set up Provador. It was a big investment. I mean, Provador is a, a marketplace backed. So marketplace is a, an, an online mm -hmm. engine. Um, Jason Wyatt and Sam Salter are the, the owners. Jason Wyatt and I and Sam are really good mates. We're both bull, we're all Bulldogs boys. Oh, uh, yep. He's a Yarraville boy. Mm -hmm. And um, they set up, helped me set up the platform. We set it up, got it running, put a logistics partner on, and it went bang. And we started off. It was it, the, the hardest thing was getting people to believe in it. Mm. So there was a couple of restaurants that wanted it. There was a couple of restaurants I wanted on it. Who were your first few that jumped on? The first conversation that I had, which is, and I, and I owe him a lot, um, was with Andrew McConnell, mm -hmm. who is probably... Everyone always asks me, who do you look up to in hospitality? I never met anybody. I yeah. don't even know half the chefs. Like, yeah. I don't. But Andrew is a is a really smart guy. I respect his brands. And for the listeners that don't know who Andrew is. Uh, so Andrew's got Cutler & Co, Cumulus, mm. Supernormal, mm. Bar Marion, mm. um, The Builder's Arms. Yeah. I respect Andrew. He's a good person. He does things right. He treats his people right. His brands are good. They're unique and they're consistent. Mm. So for me, they're the things in a business. If you tick all those, mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if Andrew partnered with me, it would give the industry and the customers confidence that this is legitimate. Mm -hmm. So we, we did a deal and he came on board and, and the rest has been amazing. Yeah. So from that point, everyone took you seriously. I mean, like it was, wasn't just Shane D'Elia flying his flag with a couple of his mates. It was yeah. Shane D'Elia, Andrew McConnell, Flower Drum, mm. Frank Kimura from Movida, yeah. um, you know, Scotty Pickett from Estelle. I mean, there's 50 brands now. You name a brand, yeah. you've got them. So, uh, so you, you went after Andrew. Who did you go after next? Well, I'd had a conversation with a few people at once. I mean, I, I had a couple of people turn me down. Mm. Did they then come back and say, hey, I made the wrong decision? Well, only one. Yeah. And I respect them too. They have to stand by their, their yeah. you, know, their, their, you know, I mean, I, I really wanted Guy with me. Guy and I are good mates and I respect the Grossi Guy family. Grossi. Yeah. And, I, and I respect his family. I mean, mm. he's, he's, he's a good family guy. Mm. And I've always said, if I can achieve what Guy's achieved with his family and how they work together so yeah. harmoniously, I'd be really happy. Yeah. You know, he's a really good guy. And, and, oh, now I want Italian food. <laughs> <laughs> so no, guy, guy, didn't, guy didn't jump on and he's still not. He's still doing his own thing. Yeah. But... You know, then I started, you know, I spoke to Scotty, Scotty from Estelle's and, and, and Matilda. He's a great mate of mine. He came yeah. on. Yeah. Frank's a good mate of mine. He came on. Jason Louie from, from, from Flower Drum came on. Yeah. You know, Rabbi Yanni from the Botanical came on. Yeah. Um, we started with like 10 guys. You know, Lucy Lou, the guys at Lucy Lou came on. Yeah. And, and we did really good, you know, and then people started joining on. And now we've got the likes of Stokehouse and Dostasio and Yeah, I love Dostasio. I mean, you think about, the, you know, the guys from, to you know, Tokyo Tina and Hanoi Hanna. I mean, you sit there and think, okay, are those type of brands sitting with your sort of prestigious, you know, brands? Mm. But can I tell you, it's a diversified market mm. and people love those brands. Oh, look, yeah. Huh? It's, it, I, I mean, listening to all these restaurants, I'm getting hungry, right? Yeah. Um, so no doubt you had your teething problems though, surely. Yep, we yeah. had a lot. Yeah. This is an online marketplace. This mm. isn't running a kitchen. Mm. So we need, we employ now at Provador, 16 people. Mm -hmm. And these are all new people. These were job seeker people. So these are re-employed people. Wow. All right, so these aren't people that were, these aren't re rehashed waiters and chefs. No. All right, these are, are skilled people that are, that are employed for, now our head of brand and marketing is amazingly talented. Yeah. We've got data analysts. We've got, I mean, it's, it's, it's a serious business. How many meals are you pushing out now a week on Provital? 
well, we had one week, which was our biggest week, which was a challenge, and we had a, and uh, we'll, we'll tip on that. But we did, that week we did twenty five thousand mm. meals which, or boxes, which each box could constitute three or four meals. Yeah, yeah. right. Wow. So. Um, and how did you deal with the logistics? Because I know it was a bit of a challenge for you. I mean, yeah. you know, you hope to get as many customers as you possibly can, but then when you get six or seven times as many customers or whatever the number was, mm. it, it, I mean, it blows up the engine almost, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the first guy that came on and helped me do Maha Go yeah. wasn't the same guy that then launched as in logistics partner, wasn't yeah. the same logistics partner that then helped me do Providor. Yeah. Because like we had a conversation said, look, we need this needs to be bigger. Mm. He, he knew straight away, he goes, mate, I'll do fruit and veg. So, um, yeah, yeah. so we moved on to somebody else who we thought was the best solution at the time. And you know, businesses evolve, businesses mm. grow. You take on different partners with different times. And But that weekend really tested us, I mean, because we're, at the end of the day, Providor is a marketplace. Yeah. I don't produce anything. Yeah. We, 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 we promote and we connect. Mm. So I can't regulate the market. No. You know, so we, tell the, we don't tell the restaurateurs how much they can sell it for, what they can sell or how much volume they mm. can sell. They do what they like. Yeah, you're just a marketplace. Yeah. You put people together, right? So, but yeah. we're the front and we're a brand. Yeah. So people went, so on like Father's Day weekend yeah. when all shit hit the fan because there was just so much volume coming through. Yeah. And people didn't get their orders too late and all that kind of stuff. We copped the brunt. And yeah. you know, you got the Melbourne public saying that Providor are, g- are greedy and we took all the orders and that, you know, yeah. rah, 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 rah. And, yeah. and, and you take it, it's it's it, it hurt. It was Father's Day. I mean, I, my customer service team, we had three and a half thousand emails come in. Plus, people don't just voice on one channel. No. They'll get angry on email, they get angry on Facebook, they get angry at you on Twitter, they get angry on Instagram, and not just once, yeah, they no. fucking barrage yeah. you all day. <laughs> so how can we physically get back to that, that many people? No, it's impossible. That, you can't. So I had nine, no, nine plus we took another four. So you know, we had, we had up to, on that weekend, 14 people, because my wife was on it, everybody was on it. They were in tears, these customer service, like in oh, tears, yeah, yeah. could not, people ripping through them. And I get it, We've, because of what happened, we had ruined people's Father's Day. And it was the same day that Dan had just announced that we're staying in lockdown. Yeah. I get it. It was a shit time. Mm. I get it. It's not the end of the fucking world. Yeah. But also, we weren't ignoring anyone. I got on the front foot. I jumped on social media. I did a video in my front yard mm. talking to people. We're really sorry. We're trying to get to everybody. Please just give us some time. And they ripped us to shreds. Yeah. Which, you take it, yeah? You take the good yeah. with the bad. But um, oh, You just, uh, oh, you know... One would hope that mankind has a bit more compassion than that. You know, mm. I I had told some friends that I had you coming on this podcast and they everyone said, ask him about Father's Day, ask yeah. him about Father's Day. And, I, you know, sorry to be ignorant, but I didn't know what happened on Father's Day, right? No. And, I go, well, I, and then I said, I'm tipping. He had a few more orders than they could deal with yeah. and the thing shit itself. Hey. He, that, is that what happened? They go, yeah, well, I go, well, what do you expect, mate? Yeah, and let me tell you, this is a three-month-old business Three-month-old business. Run by a Run kid by, from St. Albans yeah. who dropped out in yeah. year 10. Yeah. You know what I mean? We started it with a couple, you know, with, with, with 30, 40 grand. Respectfully, who, I don't think who, you were doing a coding course. Well, you know yeah. what? <laughs> so like, you know, we and, and we're here trying, we're in the middle of COVID. We can't flex like we would normally flex. Mm. And we're trying to support Melbourne's restaurants. Mm. You know, I get it. Like mm. we're, we're taking a clip of the ticket. We're putting money in the bank. I totally get it. But this isn't a, a Uber Eats or a Deliveroo or a, Mate, nah. Australia Post got it wrong that weekend too, yeah? Yeah, well, you know Australia I mean? Post is still getting it wrong. Yeah, you know? so, I mean, yeah. like, and nobody's doing, you know, we, we got ripped apart. Yeah. I mean, let's, just, let's stop there. Let's compare, sorry to be, uh, just jump on you, but if you compare Providor, a three-month-old business started by you, a few of your key guys, and getting a few restaurants together for the purpose of helping the freaking community and bringing yeah. the CBD out of the shithole that it's in and helping other restaurants and not, hey, let's do it so I can make a bit of coin, but helping mm. everybody out. You built that business in three months. You compare that to how much money and how much time they spent on Uber Eats yeah. in Silicon Valley. And, it, you know, come on, man. And they still get it wrong. They still get it wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. And we deliver to now, Providor delivers across the state. We deliver to Ballerine, Ballarat, Bendigo, Gippsland. What you're Shepparton. telling me that I could be in uh, Mount Martha. Yeah, and you can get super normal at your door. Next day. Next day. <sighs> All the way up, all the way up. I don't to, mind super normal. It's a nice restaurant. That's no, a great yeah, restaurant. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. That's a great. I mean, that's we, we want to. We, my, my brother is um living is lives in Phillip Island. He had yeah. I think he had Movita last night. I oh mean, yeah, I like Movita too. So yeah. Hey, you know what you've also done, Shane, with this Providor thing? And uh, again, I go back to the point that we said right at the start of this podcast that when you focus on who you serve and how you serve them, if you focus on what you give as opposed to what you get, magic happens, right? Mm. 
I um, have been fortunate enough, you know, working in and around the city for the last 20 odd years. And I, I was fortunate enough to, you know, have lunch at Maha. I've had lunch at Movita. I've had lunch at Supernormal. I, you know, I've got a lot of clients that are stockbrokers and, you know, they do their best work on a Monday, Tuesday, yeah. Wednesday lunch, you know, as you know, and I see the smile on your face. Okay. But now what you're doing is you're providing this opportunity for people that don't get to go into the city yeah. to experience that fine dining. Even post COVID and all this bullshit that yeah. we're going through, you, you know, this is going to grow beyond this. Well, I mean, if you think about what we, we started off as a business that was here to help people through this period. Yeah. But what we've actually done is we've res reshaped the dining landscape. You can now get the best brands in the state, anywhere in the state, five days a week. But what that also does is if you think about the, tr the, tr the traditional market, if you want to have catering at your home, all yeah. right, it's a kid's birthday, it's your 50th birthday, whatever it is, you have to go through a, tr a traditional model. You get a caterer to come in, they quote it up, they charge you an arm and a leg, you end up with party pies and sausage rolls, mm and they're gone, mm. all right? Or you're having a small event at home, 10 people, you end up cooking it yourself or getting some shitty takeaway, you have a good time, whatever. Now, we're about to launch a product called Providor People. So what Providor People will be, oh. it's, a, it's staff. So Good from yeah, you. Yeah, so you can get, you can come into your boardroom like this and you're having, you know, a few of your mates, you order all your food, I'm gonna get some stuff from Flower Drum, I'm gonna get some stuff from here, it arrives. Oh, this and is you can also idea. get a waiter and a chef and they do it all. And I'm not talking waiters and chefs at 200 bucks an hour. You know, reasonable rate, 60, 70 bucks an hour. They come in, they do it, they cook it, they serve it. And these are just white labeled, provador people. Um, you know, you're having, mate, I, I, before we got locked down, I wanted to test the concept and I had it at my house. I took two of my staff and I said to them, I said, you don't know me, you don't know anybody here. I'm gonna order food from other venues, not from Maha, so it's not food that you know. Just order it all. My wife's name is Maha as well. Maha got him at home and said, this is where the cups are, this is where the crockery are. So we use all your stuff, so it's cheap. You don't have to hire glass, we don't have to hire nothing. It was the best night. We had 10 people at home, five blokes, their missus, we had a great time. Flower drum over here, yeah. super normal over here. It was amazing. My Vita over here. See, and that's, I, I like that type of dining, but what I, those people that know me know that, you know, I pretend that I'm busy at work, but really I just move paper from one side of the desk <laughs> to the other to look busy. Um, and the whole concept of Provador and eating uh, a fine dining food, uh, restaurant quality food in your home is awesome. But for me, I don't want to cook it. But now you've got the you Provador people. And that's, I mean, that's where, that, I know that's where the silver lining is moving forward. Because as you're allowed, to, as you come out of lockdown and as you're allowed to start having people in your home, you'll start doing things at home. Yeah. And, you know, we think about, we think about all the events that are coming up, Christmas at home. How good would it be to have, you know, a... Jeez, who's an Estelle Christmas hamper at home with a the chef there doing it for you. So you can just sit down and enjoy the day and not have to run around like an idiot. Yeah, you're changing my life, Shane Delia. You are changing <laughs> my life. Let me ask you some more questions if I can because I'm actually really freaking hungry right now. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me ask you some questions. So a lot of people listening are business owners whose business has been belted and they don't know where to turn. They don't know what to do. They don't know that they can, and I hate this word, and I, I hate it coming out of my mouth. They don't know how to pivot, mm -hmm. you know, which is the you know the, the golden word. What would you say to them? You know, what are the things that they should consider that they should do first to help them get through the next period to transform their business? Uh, I think first, the first thing is reflection on what the business was before. Mm -hmm. Was it healthy? Because if if it wasn't healthy before this point, it's it's or, it's it's not going to it's going to be done. Yeah. You need to be honest with yourself as well. Like, I mean, I know a lot of my friends in hospitality businesses have just been holding on for, you know, tooth and nail for so long, weren't really happy anyway, but it's hard to pull the plug mm. and say, I'm just done. But it, it's a better decision now while it's quiet. And I think Melbourne is the quiet as it's ever been. Mm. And I'm really enjoying that. It gives you some time to think, analyze. And you may take a belting, you may take, it might hurt financially. But what does the next five, 10 years look like? Mm. Should you just reset and start again and do something else, mm. follow a new path? Mm. Not saying give up, it's not about giving up. Like, and people say, oh, I'm not gonna just give up. But what are you fighting for? Yeah. Like, what is it? What, what is the battle that you're trying to? Like, that's when I hear people at restaurants saying, just open us up, just open us up. Open up to what? Mm. Like, what are you opening up to? Mm. You've still got the same pay rates, you've still got the same insurance, you've still got the same um, you know, uh, rent. Yeah. You're opening up to half the revenue with all the same fixed costs. Yeah. What are you rushing back to? Like, I don't get it. So 
I think people who are in, and I, 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 can't, it's, I don't think there's a blanket rule for everybody. I think that everybody's business is different. Scales of business is different. Opportunity is different. Is it, is, are you in a manufacturing business that shifts its tooling to manufacture something else? Is, are you in a hospitality business that you just realize, this is bullshit, I don't want to be in it anymore? Or is it, are you, are you in a job that you just realize this has never been something that I've enjoyed and I really want to focus now on something that I need? So you're, you're telling me now's an opportune time yeah. to you know, rip the Band-Aid off and work out what 100%. it is to do next. And when you take root the band off, it hurts, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it hurts, but yeah. it heals afterwards. Yeah, So yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, what I found intriguing, what I really enjoyed was your commentary around when Maha Go first came to life and you said, look, really, all we have to do is survive, yeah. right? And sometimes I see business owners looking through the lens of always trying to be profitable mm. and, and there are periods where that's just taken away from you. And you said, no, what I want to do is I want to survive, let's eat. Yeah. I'll have a couple of hundred bucks and you have a couple of hundred bucks. And you sort of took that angst or anxiety around turning a profit, so to speak, off the table so you could have some clarity yeah. with the decision making. I'm also intrigued, well, I've got a little shifty question, why profit all? As in the name? Yeah. Who came up with it? Me. I do all the names. I do all the branding. You're the name boy. I do the names, I do the branding, I do the playlists, mm -hmm. I do the whole lot. Anything with brand, I want I'm to know. So, sorry, I forgot I was speaking to the lion. Um, <laughs> no, I, 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 I think I know the, like, with anything with brand. That's you. I have to believe it. So Maha, is that named after your wife? Yeah. 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 I have to own the brand. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, I, I'm going to be the last man standing in every fucking fight. Mm. So I need to know what I'm fighting for. Yeah. And if I don't own the brand, what am I fighting for? Yeah, absolutely. And Provador, what how did you come up with that? Um, well, it was a play on words. Yeah, we, we spelled the D double O R to your door. Yeah. You know, provo um, we, we are a provador. We're you know in the in the in the, in the literal sense. You mm -hmm. know, we're a home of curated brands. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was it it resonated with hospitality, something people knew. I wanted one. I didn't want like two names. I wanted a one block name. Yeah, it worked. Mm -hmm. It worked, and I think it, it, it yeah it worked. Yeah, as the business as provador keeps climbing. Will you still spend time at Maha? Oh shit, yeah. Yeah. That's my passion. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I don't have a lot of hobbies. I mean, I like fit, fitness, I like cars, um, I like the footy, mm. but I love hospitality. Like I love hospitality. I love being in venues, I love creating experiences. Um, I don't ever want there to be a day where I don't own a hospitality venue. Mm -hmm. like, I love our restaurant Maha Bar in Smith Street. Mm. I, I, like I love all the venues, mm. but I love that venue. It was mm. only opened in December. Mm. So it only traded for two months or three months and yeah. it's closed. And I just want to get it back open, but I only want to open it when it's full. I yeah. don't, it's the beauty of that venue. It's a small 40 seater mm. where you're shoulder to shoulder, t-shirt and jeans, mm. cool music, dim light, Great cocktail, great food, mm. really good environment, but it needs to be packed. Yeah. You can't go in there with 10 people. No. Nah. It's a bad experience. Yeah. And I, I prefer to keep the door closed mm. and hold on to what it was than destroy what it, what it or is. Or may have a, an old fashioned lock in with the door closed. Oh, that's a... I've done that a few times. <laughs> no, no doubt. <laughs> uh, now, you, before we finish up and we're, we're getting a little bit uh, time to be wound up, um, what I. I'm just intrigued around your um, humility uh, uh, as a person and as a business leader. I reckon, you know, what rings true to me in, in having these conversations is that you're nothing without the people around you, right? Whether it's your family, your circle of friends, the Western Bulldogs, uh, uh, your team members, uh, both Pro Provador and Maha. I've often, I've been talking to business owners for 23 years, Shano. And um, if I ask, if I tell it up the number one biggest challenge for business owners, hands down, it would be our people. Mm. We really struggle with our people. You touched on it before about being honest and all that sort of stuff, and that's how you've done it. How, let's say someone's listening to this and say, yeah, you know, I think that's the next step for me to surround myself with the best people. What should they do to find, attract, and stay on hold of their best people. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, we talk about culture a lot as well. I mean, yeah. culture is really important. I think people need to believe it, believe in you. I think that your my team, my team know that I'm not the, I'm reactive and I'm blunt and I'm not always like, you know, my head chef came to me the other day and said, I think we need to do something for the staff. You know, mental health at the moment is not great. I'm like, I can give a fuck. Like, I mean, I, I, 
hard nut, mate. Like, yeah. I mean, I've suffered mental health. I've had depression. I've got ADHD. I, I get it. Mm. Don't throw that mental health, card, mental health card at me like it's an issue. That was my first reaction. Yeah. And then I went back and went, fuck, well, maybe we do need to do something. Mm. Because if people are feeling down and because these are talented, artistic people who love serving and creating food and now mm. they're packing boxes with food, mm. okay, well, I'm a leader. It's time to lead. You know, I think that, you know, the, the, I suppose the answer to how do you get better people is to be a better leader. You know, be a better leader. Work on yourself mm. and then, you know, that will flow on to others. Mm. Isn't that funny? Hey, it's my guys, it's my guys. It's it. You know, my team are no good when Shane's telling me, well, Jason, if you want to be, have a greater team. Be a better leader. Be yeah. a better leader. And I think that takes a lot of vulnerability. You need to be vulnerable to be, a vulnerable leadership I believe in. I don't mm. think you have that old school hard footy, coach mentality mm. where it's crack everyone's skull and follow me to the promised land. Mm. Um, there's times for that, mm -hmm. but if it's not every day, you need to be vulnerable, you need to connect, you need to be honest, um, and you need to, I mean, uh, you need to be humble too, I think. Yeah. You know, I'm always, I, I try not to flaunt and flashy stuff around, especially around my people when mm. they're working hard, because I was that bloke, you know? I was that bloke that you was working for 50 grand a year, doing 65, 70 hours a week, mm. um, just wanting more. Mm. and, and you don't need somebody flashing shit in front of your face. Nah. You know, you don't need to be that, you know, but, you know, it's it, you need to inspire people too, but inspire them from who you are, not what you have. Yeah, exactly. Shane Delia, this has been nothing short of outstanding. So prop it all, uh, we find it on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I'm pretty confident that uh, everyone that's listened to this is going to jump on and, and order a meal or two. Okay. Hopefully there's a few of the people that were hating on me from uh, Father's Day <laughs> yeah. can go on. You know what You know that re what really hurt us from Father's Day? No. All the people that went and hated on us on like things like Facebook, mm. you know, and they go in there and that destroys your Facebook ranking, yeah. which then has a financial impact on the job, which then in turn hurts the restaurants. Yeah. Because if we can't convert sales, you're not hurting me. No. I don't care. Yeah. Hit the restaurants. Yeah. And then they come to us, why aren't we converting sales? I'm like, well, because all these Muppets went in there and slammed us out over the weekend. Yeah, because we had 27,000 orders uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in three hours. Hopefully they can go in there and leave us a good, a good yeah, comment. Yeah, it would be nice to get a good review and, mm. a, and a good comment. Shane, mate, I've really enjoyed this. I'll tell you now, I'm really freaking hungry right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, mate, it's been a pleasure to spend uh, this hour or so with you. you you're outstanding. And I, I will say this, mate, you're an inspiration, not from what you've achieved. I'll tell you that right now but from the person that you are. And you are, I, I say this truthfully and uh, authentically, you are a giver and we need more people like you around. Thank Thanks, you, Shane Delia. Thanks, mate. Thanks.